The world's military expenditure reaches an all-time high. A whopping $2.24 trillion was spent in 2022. A global rise for the eighth consecutive year and an indication we're living in an increasingly insecure world. I'm Yashni Paniachi and today's newsmaker is global military spending. A leading conflict and armaments think tank released a report on global military spending this week, and the numbers are staggering. Russia's war in Ukraine has driven the biggest annual increase in military expenditure in Europe since the end of the Cold War three decades ago. China and Japan lead spending in Asia and Oceania, and Saudi Arabia is now the fifth biggest global military spender, outranking the UK, Germany and France. But it's not just current wars that have pumped up the volume. Spending has been on the rise for years. It's partly due to the increasing size and sophistication of weapons, and likely also due to increasingly unstable geopolitical arenas, with countries trying to future-proof their defense apparatus. For some, the money spent on weaponry is galling. They say this money could be redirected into climate crisis mitigation or ending global hunger. But is it as simple as that? Before we get into the details, let's take a look at the numbers. Despite soaring inflation, post-pandemic challenges and concerns of a recession, global military expenditure has reached a record high. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, world military spending increased by 3.7% in 2022. Recently published data adjusts the country's spending for inflation and gives real-term figures. The U.S. outspent every other nation with $877 billion in military investment. China followed with nearly $300 billion. Russia rose to third spot, spending more than $86 billion on its military in the past year. India's military expenditure increased by 6% and reached $81 billion. And Saudi Arabia became the fifth biggest spender with $75 billion. These five countries together accounted for 63% of the global military spending. Meanwhile, Europe's military expenditure increased by 13%, largely due to the war on its soil. Ukraine spent $44 billion on its military in 2022. The 640% rise is the highest single-year increase ever recorded and the billions of dollars in military aid it received from the West wasn't even included in this figure. Yet this places a huge burden on Ukraine's economy. Kyiv's military expenditure accounted for more than a third of its GDP last year. Russia also increased its military spending by an estimated 9.2%. Some experts say this rise shows that the war is costing more than Russia had anticipated. The war also led neighboring countries to expand their military power the newest NATO member, Finland, saw the sharpest rise of 36%. Lithuanian military spending grew by 27%, while the NATO hopeful Sweden spent 12% more than last year. And the military expenditure of Central and Western European countries grew to the highest level since the end of the Cold War. The biggest rise in the Middle East was recorded by Saudi Arabia with 16%. Increased oil revenues and a fast-growing economy raised its purchasing power and helped to boost its military. Despite heightened tensions with Syria and Palestine, Israel's military spending fell by 4.2%. In Asia, Japan put $46 billion into its military, a nearly 6% increase. It follows a policy shift to expand its defense capabilities in response to growing threats from China, North Korea and Russia. South Korea was an outlier. Its 22-year streak of increased military spending ended as the nation spent 2.5% less than the previous year.
We're going to unpack all of this now with our panel. Joining me from Stockholm is Lucie Berosudro. She's the director of the Military Expenditure and Arms Production Program at Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. In Washington, D.C. is Caroline Rose, the director of the Strategic Blind Spots Portfolio of the New Lines Institute. And Emmanuel Dupuy is in Paris. He's the president of the Institute for European Perspective and Security Studies. A warm welcome. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. Lucy, I'm going to start with you. Is the war in Ukraine the main reason for this rise in expenditure, or are there other factors at play here, like European spending going up after Russia illegally annexed Crimea back in 2014? Hello, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, indeed, we've, we've observed uh, at CIPRI that world military expenditure grew by 3.7% in real terms in 2022 to reach a record height of 2.2 trillion uh, US dollars. Um, and indeed, Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a major driver uh, of the growth in spending uh, this year. Um, and military expenditure in Europe, so including Russia and Ukraine, rose by 13% during the year, which was the largest annual increase in total European spending in the post-Cold War era. Um, but other increases uh, also in Asia and Oceania also contributed to the global growth in 2022. Emmanuel, why is Europe expanding its military and raising its defence budget so much right now? Well, there's a various reason. First of all, the Ukraine is one of the reasons, but there's also the impact of the enlargement of NATO. One has to have in mind that the largest, uh, the, the recent, more recent uh, um, um, adhesion of NATO was uh, Montenegro and North Macedonia, and now uh, uh, Finland, and waiting for Sweden. And of course, this arises the need for more material, more interoperability with the rest of the NATO countries. And of course, uh, you cannot have the dedication of 2% of the GDP, which was lost in 2014 for the horizon of 2024 uh, uh, during the Wales summit in 2014, and not have military expenditure. So I think Ukraine, as of course, uh, I think this was clearly said by my colleague and clearly re uh, written by the CIPRI uh, uh, last report, uh, Ukraine is one of the elements, but not only as uh, there has been a certain number of uh, expenditure of military uh, equipment in the south of uh, the European Union. Uh, I'm thinking of Greece in regards to the tension with Turkey and, of course, on the southern shores of the Mediterranean. One must assess the fact that, for example, Algeria has increased its military budget by 130 percent during the last year. So it's an overall uh, increase of military expenditure as a certain number of uh, uh, elements and documents uh, are abiding by that. The strategic compass are read, uh, 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 finally agreed by the European Union in large March. The NATO strategic concept, which was signed in June of uh, during the last Madrid summit, and of course the ambition to rise the 2% GDP to maybe three. Some are, would argue 4% during the last the next Vilnius summit. Uh, which will happen in July. Mm -hmm. The next NATO Vilnius summit will happen in July. Uh, Caroline, let me come to you. Uh, has regional securitization been set up because of the collapse of a rules-based understanding of territorial autonomy? Well, certainly. I think that, you know, the discussion about beefing up uh, defense spending has been a very lively debate um, within the alliance for quite a long time. And it's quite fascinating, and I think that the CIP, recent CIPRI report really does show that now the 2 percent of GDP goal that was set years ago has now become more of a floor rather than an objective or a ceiling. Um, and I think that, in part, it's been shaped by this debate, by this very long-held objective to boost defense spending to boost interoperability, to boost these exercises. Um, the Ukraine war, of course, has also been a driving factor of this. But I also do agree that, you know, when we look at the EU's recent um, a strategic foreign policy and defense document, it does show that they are um, understanding and acknowledging a more um, riskier foreign and international environment where we do have an aggressor of, of Russia, but then we also have a strategic rival, China. And so I do think that this has been a reaction to all of these factors. 
Well, Lucy, let me uh, come to you to pick up on uh, what Caroline was saying there about China, because uh, Asia and the Indo-Pacific uh, region, we've seen Japan's military spending reaching levels not seen since 1960. It's been a country that's taken usually a fairly passive stance until now. What's Tokyo gearing up for? Um, yes, indeed, we've seen, um, actually since I think it was last year, um, new strategy documents, or maybe earlier this year, new strategy, uh, you know, defense documents coming out uh, from Japan, uh, and where um, you can see Tokyo is sort of repositioning itself um, slightly compared to its previous, you know, traditional, well, what was called, you know, pacifist stance. Um, and so Japan has also so like adopted this similar goal as we were discussing earlier, the, the similar like target that NATO is setting for its members of like two percent of GDP spent on defense. So in the case of Japan, they call it spending on defense and security. So it goes a bit beyond you know, just the on forces, um, but still it does show this change of posture. Uh, and I think what has been quite clear in, in the Japanese documents is um, so like. Lucy just seems to, we've lost her for a bit uh, there. So, Emmanuel, I'm going to come to you and uh, still uh, focus on, on Asia and the Indo-Pacific because we've seen India having the fourth highest expenditure. Is this all directly related to its border tensions with Pakistan and China? Well, I think what you have to have in mind as well is that the uh, military, the, ex the explosion of the military expenditure is not only linked of the conflict today, but the, of the conflicts to come tomorrow. And this is why all of the Indo-Pacific countries are rearming. And this is why I must say that France is very happy to have finally uh, been able to sold 24 uh, Rafales and uh, to 18 uh, César or Witzer to Indonesia. So it's a global all. Um, military um, uh, explosion. Uh, you mentioned India. You can you rightly mentioned Japan. Let's mention China. China has been increasing its military expenditure for the last 30 years. Uh, and it is uh, rising uh, to now 300 billion of euros, which is very far yet from the ex military expenditure uh, of next year to come for the United States. Some would argue that the official sh uh, figure 877 billion will be more or less 950 billion of, of, of dollars. Uh, but of course, one has to assess the fact that the tensions are rising not only in the eastern flank of NATO, but on the external flank of the Occidental uh, indignant strategy, which is, of course, Indo-Pacific, and not only uh, uh, Pacific, also in Indo, Indo Ocean as well. And this is why you have countries like the Gulf countries, who are rearming very strongly. And let's not forget that Saudi Arabia still is the fourth of the fifth uh, budget uh, uh, military, uh, countries in, in terms of military spending. And of course, you mentioned in India, but it's not only about pa Pakistan. India is rearming itself in regards to the possible tension uh, um, in the indignant uh, or containment strategy of the United States uh, in regards to, to China. Uh, Caroline, Emmanuel mentioning Saudi Arabia there, and uh, Saudi Arabia spent more of its GDP on defense than any other country last year, except Ukraine. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute says Riyadh imports almost 80% of its arms from the United States. Does this also speak to that very close relationship and influence these two countries have on so many levels, not just defense purchases? Well, certainly, I think that that's absolutely notable. And, and also, just to quickly mention, I think that Emmanuel is completely right when it comes to tensions in the Indo-Pacific. It's well worth noting that uh, you know, tensions in the Taiwan Strait has, have also heavily influenced this. Now, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, I think that um, even with the context of recent normalization efforts with Iran, um, we're still seeing the region <clears throat> prepare and arm itself for potential direct conflict with Iran-aligned militias, but then also other actors in the region. And we still are seeing, seeing the region still climb this ladder of escalation. And you're right to say that Saudi Arabia, it's notable, next to Ukraine, which I believe in the CIPRI report, they said it was around 34% um, of their own GDP. I mean, that's astronomical. The fact that Saudi Arabia is right there next to that um, is extremely notable um, in regards to, to how they perceive defense spending, how they perceive not only um, defense of their own territory, but also potential offensive measures in the region against Iran-aligned militias and other actors. And I think that we're going to see this trend continue in the region. Okay, Lucy, it seems our world in 
2023 is almost more dangerous than ever before. This really can't bode well for peace and security now or in the future, can it? I think that um, the rise in military expenditure at the global level, as we were discussing on, on sort of like certain subregions, uh, is more it's a symptom. Uh, indeed, of a more uh, insecure world, uh, you can see that governments, despite um, you know economic challenges, high inflation, other you know pressing you know public expenditure or policy priorities that need to be addressed, still choose to allocate you know more um, more to the military and to their armed forces. So I think that really reflects a general sense uh, in different you know, constituencies and, and governments that um, there is a high threat perception um, that armed forces need to be modernized um, to deter such threats. Um, so in it, it's, it's rather, um, yeah, again, like a symptom, a reflection of this more like insecure feeling that seems to predominate in many countries around the world at the moment. Manuel, can diplomatic initiatives to end current conflicts really take precedence over war? Is there a political will to do that? Well, if you take uh, Clausewitz, yes, but I'm not sure that this is still accurate. Um, of course, everyone is abiding the fact that after you go to war, you go to the diplomatic initiative. I'm not sure the Russians believe that, or I think the Russians believe it in the other way around. I think Vladimir Putin has reinterpreted Clausewitz's theory. But I think what is important is based on the fact that everyone is leaning for peace. That does not mean that everyone is not leaning at the same time to rearm itself, strongly rearm itself. You know, the French military doctrine, is winning is uh, uh, can be synthesized as uh, has the chief of staff mentioned it a few months ago winning the war before the war starts that is to deter any possibility of having a war and this is why we are increasing our military budget it will be increased during the next 5 years for the uh, till 2025 where we, when we will have 70 billion of euros dedicated to defense we have now already 44 which is already uh, something which was not obvious at the beginning of the mandate of Emmanuel Macron and of course uh, we need to uh, understand the fact that if one or a group of countries uh, is uh, uh, rearming inside the European Union that needs to be assessed by all of the European Union countries that is what precisely is about this strategic compass to have interoperability to buy together weapons, to have common uh, perspective to build a certain number of armed systems that we need to build in more cooperation. There are more or less five times the number of armed systems in European Union than there is in the United States. We need to have more common material in order to not waste time, in order to be able to use them all together, or at least the 22 now European Union members uh, who are in NATO, and the 25 now European Union who have assessed by the PESCO uh, strategy the, the, uh, and to, to cluster more on, on the CSDP, Common Security and Defence Policy. This is why the decision to buy in common uh, munitions, one million munitions now, one million munitions tomorrow, is of strategic importance as well. Caroline, at the end of the day, all these weapon purchases, it's also about making money, isn't it? A war is big business. Peace is not profitable for many of the players involved. So how much do we have to look at, at the business aspect of war and countries uh, that are usually tied in some way or the other to the defence industry selling to each other? Well, certainly, I think that in this environment, there have been many companies and many actors that have seen this as an opportunity and have capitalized upon this doubt and uncertainty in the international order and have, of course, made, of course, made a huge profit. And I think that even within um, the, the NATO alliance, um, even within the European Union, there now is this greater need and this greater recognition for coordination over weapons acquisition <clears throat> and procurement. Um, given now that, especially with aid to Ukraine, um, a lot of these industrial bases are being hollowed out and there's not a lot of coordination. Um, so, you know, while we're seeing this massive boost in uh, defensive measures and, and, and these buying sprees, there is little coordination going on, even amongst allies and partners. 
And so I think that this is presenting a quite worrying trend. And I, I, I completely agree with my colleague from um, CIPRI who, who mentioned that this is a symptom of the problem, not necessarily the problem itself. And uh, even amidst such great uh, solidarity uh, expressed within NATO and the alliance, um, we're still not necessarily seeing the level of cooperation and communication that we need to see um, uh, to avert uh, major escalation. Uh, Lucy, I'm going to come to you for one of the findings from uh, the report, and that's about military spending in relation to inflation. It was something that your team found quite surprising. What were the findings from this? Yes, indeed. When uh, my team and I were like, collecting the data that you can now you know, see in the report, Initially, we sort of expected that the trend would be a decrease because despite you know, all the, you know, the announcements and the, the added you know, budgets for, for the military and the armed forces, still in many countries around the world, um, inflation was very high. So we sort of expected that you know, at the end of the day, when we would look at the numbers in real terms, so you know, uh, discounting for inflation, the trend would be actually going down. Uh, but that was not the case. Um, and even in countries with like very you know, high inflation, so you can see, for instance, the United, the United States had you know, 8% inflation roughly last year, uh, but still the, the results show, show you know, growth in military expenditure in the US. So I think you know, circling back to, to a point I made earlier, is this really this, I think this really shows the priority given by governments to the military and to the defense forces. Um, because despite you know inflation, um, the still the <laughs> the added money, the extra cash that's been put uh, was it meant it was really higher than that you know um, yeah than that the uh, inflation made made it uh, look like. So um, uh, again, I really think it shows the priority that's being given in many countries around the world. But at the same time, uh, so this is like you know the aggregate and the global trend. Still, if you look at it country by country, there are some countries where um, inflation did bite into the, the military spending growth. That's the case, for instance, of like South Korea, but even in, in, in Europe, where, you know, as we were talk talking, the Russian aggression, Russia's aggression prompted high increases. There have been some declines. That's the case, I think, of the Czech Republic. Um, and in some of the Baltic states like Estonia or Latvia, where, mm -hmm. you know, there has been a significant amount of cash added, still inflation meant that growth was very low, 1% one, uh, 1 or 0%. Emmanuel, when we talk about inflation, and in many countries there is a cost of living crisis now, do governments still have then the support of the people in the country when people are dealing with uh, the economic burden of uh, an ongoing war right now, but also seeing this cost of, of living crisis? Uh, does that factor into how much a government spends on defence? Well, first you have to assess that, for example, in France, defense is not the principal budget. It is only the 10th or the 11th budget, and the debt is way, way, way high, higher, or, 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 of course, education as well. Uh, now, uh, to respond to your question, it's very simple. The last survey that was asked for the French whether or not we should invest in defense spending in order to help Ukraine, 65 percent of the French are saying yes. So there still is a strong will and strong impact, and I think a very clear dedication for to prepare our country for the so-called economy of war or to prepare our country for potential high intensity uh, uh, conflict i mean the spirits uh, the um, narrative is that the french are uh, I understand that we have changed period for uh, not only because there was the 24th of February of last year, because the, because the crises are all around us. They may be of high intensity in the eastern pillar or in the eastern flank of NATO. They are of low intensity in the southern uh, in the southern area. And this, we, we have been assessing this for at least 10 years when the French have been investing against the fight against terrorism, against the fight against piracy, and against mm -hmm. narco tra trafficking. So it's not only uh, to be prepared to go potentially to war uh, against the Uberis of Russia today and China tomorrow, but to be prepared for any type of conflict. This is why it's not only the increase of expenditures, but the money that we're putting in such in some system, in some armed system, more money spent on deterrence, more mm -hmm. money spent this year, five, six million, uh, six billion euros for the, the defense expenditure in 2023, more or less 53 billion till the end of 2025. Uh, intelligence, five billion uh, this year again, uh, and again to prepare to fight in the new commons. 
not only air, not only land, not only sea, but on the sea, mm -hmm. outer space, and potentially cyber. And of course, the moral, uh, the moral forces, as President Macron puts it, is very important. We have to prepare a society to be prepared to go uh, morally to war to mm -hmm. be in sort of having a social resilience. It's not only about building the system of arms, but building the people in capacity to use these systems of arms. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have to leave the conversation there, but thank you to all our guests, Lucie Berrosedro, Emmanuel Dupi, thank and you. Caroline Rose. And thank you very much for watching. You can follow us on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Yashni Pariachi. Take care. Bye-bye.